votre toast, je peux vous le rendre, Seigneur, Seigneur, car avec les soldats, il est heureux, heureux s'entendre, pour plaisir, pour plaisir, ils ont les combats, le cirque est plein ce jour de fête, le cirque est plein Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Lackawanna Pastimes. This is our 60, 62nd and the last episode for 2023. Um, I'm Sarah Puccini, the Assistant Director at the Lackawanna Historical Society. Today's topic is one of usually great interest in Northeastern Pennsylvania. We'll be talking about the Mafia and their ties to the garment industry. We'll be joined today by David Whitwer and Catherine Rios, the authors of Mur Murder, in the Garment Murder in the Garment District. David is a professor of American Studies at Penn State Harrisburg. He received an undergraduate degree from DePaul University and has a PhD and an MA in history from Brown University. David's scholarship focuses on the impact of union corruption scandals on modern American politics, bringing together the intersection historical fields of labor, politics, journalism, and organized crime. David was named the Penn State Laureate for the 2020-2021 academic year, lecturing on his current book project, Searching for Jimmy Hoffa. He recently returned from a year in Finland as a Fulbright scholar, lecturing on labor and organized crime. Catherine Rios teaches writing and digital media as part of the communications program at Penn State Harrisburg. She holds a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in class and an MFA from Columbia University in screenwriting. Her creative activities include screenwriting, filmmaking, and interactive design, and she is the co-creator of One Plus One, an interactive engagement game. She is the team lead of the collaboratory, proposed learning space for Penn State Harrisburg to enhance interdisciplinary research and STEAM learning. She also serves as the creative consultant for LEAP Research and Innovation and was the founding resident artist and creative director of The Make Space, a community created arts collective in Harrisburg. I'll turn the program over now to David and Catherine to tell us more about the garment industry. All right, thanks for that great introduction, Sarah. So I'll share Thank screen. You. And, uh, and then uh, I'll talk for the first part and then Catherine's gonna take uh, the latter part and then we're gonna save lots and lots of time for questions. So we hope that you do have questions because uh, they're oftentimes the best part of the, of the presentation from my point of view. So yeah, thank you all for, uh, for gathering and for giving Catherine and I a chance to talk about our research and also our beloved most recent book. So uh, as the title suggests, the book is about a murder and a murder that takes place in Manhattan in 1949. Uh, it also involves uh, racketeering in the garment industry. Uh, in, in this case, right, we're talking about the garment district in New York. For some reason, I think this map, which is the third from the left on my is super useful. But as I look at it now, I'm not sure how much it is. But the garment district is that part of, uh, of Manhattan, right to the west of the theater district. And, and we think of it now as sort of quaint buildings, but in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, it was the heart of uh, really what was the biggest industry in New York City, and it was where the bulk of women's dresses uh, were manufactured out of. So this is a, a story really about racketeering involving the garment district, but here's where it comes to what we're talking about today. Key events involved uh, organized crime in Northeast Pennsylvania. And we'll have uh, some detail about that and we can take questions if there are, uh, are questions about that. So the background history for the book, uh, and since I'm a historian, I'm all about the significance of the background history, has to do with the rebirth of the main union in this industry, which was the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which was reborn uh, in 1933. So it was really on its last legs uh, after a, a, a climatic and uh, problematic 1920s. If you were in my US history course, I would say there's there's irony to the rebirth of the Garment Workers Union in 1933, just like there's irony to the rebirth of organized labor in general. It's the heart of the Great Depression. So 1933, across the country, unemployment is at 20%. In industrial cities, it might be 50 or 60%. But it, you have the combination of the Great Depression and the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt that creates a sort of very dramatic moment for unions to re be reborn. And amongst the unions that are reborn is the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. They stage an organizing strike in the garment district in New York in, uh, in August, 1933, and it's wildly successful. Uh, they sent out maybe 10 or 20,000 organizers. 
but they didn't expect as many women to join as did basically all of the shops. Uh, people who hadn't even been approached by union organizers walked out to join the strike. And in the wake of it, this union was reborn so that uh, in the months and years following August 1933, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union is the largest union in New York, and it's also the third or fourth largest union in the American Federation of Labor. Now, that rebirth was great, but from the union's point of view, it can only maintain its strength if it finds a way to stabilize the industry, to, to create a system where there isn't this constant cutthroat competition in the garment industry. And so they create a network of union contractors to stabilize the relationship between jobbers and contractors, which is totally fascinating if you have any idea what a jobber or a contractor is in this case. And so that's what I'll tell you just a little bit here. So, so okay. a jobber, is everything okay? A jobber is who we think of when we think of a dress manufacturer. So a jobber would be uh, if Sarah Pacini, for instance, decides she wants to make dresses, she would set up a firm and she would hire a dress designer and that designer would create a dress that might say retailer for $30. And that designer would create a, like a fabric pattern, like, uh, like my mom used to make dresses at home. So it would be a fabric pattern. And then you would cut the fabric for that. But at that point, the jobber doesn't make the rest of the dress. They send out that cut fabric and those patterns to people who are called contractors. And that's typically what we think of if we think anything at all about the, uh, about the garment industry. The contractor is basically a person who has a room full of say 60 to 100 sewing machines and 60 to 100 women who are operating those sewing machines who are taking those fabric pieces, using that pattern and putting together the dresses. And so it's a tight relationship between the two. The fabric goes out to the contractor, contractor makes the dress, sends the dress back to the jobber who then sells it to Macy's or whatever the big dress retailer at the time would be. And that relationship tended to be cutthroat. So contractors were always competing to get work from jobbers. Jobbers were always uh, pitting one contractor against the other. And so wages were constantly being driven down and the union was always being beaten that way. So what the union contracts they create in the mid 1930s essentially do is they put a floor under that. They tell all unionized jobbers that you have to work with three or four contractors that are registered to you. And then when you create a dress design, the union will say how much it would cost to produce that dress. And the union would then tell the contractor, you get to charge 30% more than what that cost is. And so it creates a floor under that competition, a floor under wages, and it creates a kind of element of stability that allows the union to create a, a, a better wages, better conditions for the workers and more stability for the people in the industry. But what it also does, right, is it creates a perfect opportunity for anybody who can find a way to evade those controls. So any jobber who can find a non-union contractor can get that contractor who can pay lower wages, has more flexibility in what he produces and how he produces it. And in the dress industry, the, the profit margin is so thin, competition is so fierce, that the difference in just a matter of a few pennies, five or 10 cents in what it makes to, to manufacture a dress can make the difference between a profitable year and, uh, and a disastrous year. So it creates great incentive. And organized crime comes in the, into this business in the sense that you have organized crime connected truckers like this guy uh, you see on the right here, Abe Chait. And what they do is they provide a way to evade the union controls and they link jobbers who are looking for non-union contractors with non-union contractors who are looking for work. And so they'll tell the jobber, they'll say, I can get your cut fabric to a non-union contractor who will charge you less, and I can make sure the union won't find out about it or that the union can't stop it. And they say the same thing to the non-union contractors. They say, we'll find you work and we'll make sure the union can't stop it. And so they provide protection from the union using essentially the organized crime tools of corrupting particular local union officials or the threat of violence. And then essentially they charge a fee in addition to what the trucking freight charge would be from both the jobbers and the contractors. Now, if you're like, hey, this is totally fascinating, but it sounds like it's all a New York story, a key role is played by Northeast Pennsylvania. Because beginning in the 1930s, Northeast Pennsylvania becomes a place that many of the non-union contractors go to set up. Essentially, they relocate their shops from the garment district in Manhattan 
which is more easily supervised, more easily watched by the union out to Northeast Pennsylvania to the areas of Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, Pittston, small coal mining towns in the middle of nowhere where the union doesn't have a strong presence. And out there, what they find is a plentiful labor source, right? Which is it's the wives of unemployed anthracite miners, families that are desperate to have some source of income. And here along comes this industry that hires women. And so you see a, a, a big, a big available labor source for these contractors to tap into. What emerges is a network of mob connected or mob connected, mob protected shops, which to say you might have your own shop. It might be Whitworth's contractor shop, but in order to make sure that I can get my business to New York with these non-union jobbers, I might bring on a mobster as a partner, or I might simply pay a mobster for protection. And in all of this, like there are different organized crime figures involved, but the dominant figure in Northeast Pennsylvania in this period, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, is Russell Buffalino. Now, this is a growing problem in the 1930s, a growing problem in the 1940s. World War II provides enough business, it's not a crisis, but at the end of the war, the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union has to find a way to stem this flow of work and business to these non-union contractors. And that's where the other main character in the book, Min Matheson, comes to play a role. So she becomes the dominant uh, International Ladies' Garment Workers Union leader in Northeast Pennsylvania in the 1940s and 1950s. She came from a radical family in Chicago. Her father had been uh, an early revolutionary against Tsarist Russia and relocated to Chicago. She herself had joined the Young Communist League and then the Communist Party. She left the Communist Party in 1931, but she remains a militant uh, labor organizer. She ended up working for the main dressmakers union in New York City, the Garment Workers Local 22. She even became like a, one of the key organizers in that strike in August 1933. And then she went on to become a, a holder in the office, which may not strike you as that unusual, but it's one of the ironies of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. The bulk of its membership were women, but in the gender conventions of the day, the bulk of the leadership were men. So she was unusual in assuming, uh, assuming union office. She ends up having children. And in this period, the union's not friendly to a woman that tries to combine both child rearing and uh, both motherhood and union office. So she leaves. Her husband gets a job with the union in Northeast Pennsylvania. She follows him out there. And then when the union launches a new organizing drive to deal with this growing non-union threat in Northeast Pennsylvania, she becomes She's drawn into that organizing campaign and then drawn back into the union. By 1946, she's the manager of Local 249, which is based in Wilkes-Barre, and she becomes the dynamic leader of the union movement in Northeast Pennsylvania. A lot of what we talk about in the book has to do with her. Now, the title event has to do with uh, a murder that happened in Manhattan in 1949, just off 7th Avenue, which is the heart of the garment district, right? It's a fairly fancy area. Off 7th Avenue, those side streets, 35th Street is where he was murdered. These were filled with garment manufacturing shops. And 35th Street was one that was uh, predominantly non-union and mob connected. And he had gone there to organize uh, these non-union mob connected shops. Uh, and the person who was murdered is William Lurie. So on my screen, that's the guy on the right. In that small world setting, it turns out William Lurie is Min Matheson's brother. So he was murdered in the middle of the afternoon on a busy work day in the garment district. Those two men on the bottom right, Ben Macri and John Giusto, were the people who murdered him. Uh, it happens in such a way that from the union's point of view, it was meant to send a signal that the mob was telling them they could not organize in this area. And so the union's response was quite strong and quite militant. So the photo that you're looking at is the funeral procession for William Lurie. And what you're looking at is 8th Avenue, one of those broad, wide avenues. And the day of the funeral procession, the union called a one-day strike, shutting down the entire garment industry in New York City. We think maybe as many as 60,000 workers participated in this demonstration and in the march. The union offered what was known at the time as a huge reward, 25,000, which maybe isn't that big to us, but at the time, that's a quarter million dollars for any information that would bring not just these killers, but the people who hired the killers to justice. And yet a big part of what the book is about is the fact that the union's effort to take on the mob in this way in 1949 and 1950 was doomed. The level of police corruption was so great. The level of judicial corruption was so great. 
the union or the mob's ability to, to harness violence was so great that the effort was doomed. So as the union tries to picket uh, those mob connected places, they find that the police would come and ignore the mobsters who were beating the pickets, but they would arrest the union pickets or the union leadership. Eventually, one of the killers, uh, Ben Macri is arrested. He's uh, put on trial, but the mob uh, makes contact with two of the key witnesses and basically fixes the trial. And so in the wake of this fixed trial, in the wake of the violence against their pickets and their union leadership, the union comes to acknowledge a need to find some accommodation, some way to work with the mob so that they can still continue to build the union, but find a, a way to live with organized crime. And essentially, they reach out to and make a deal with that guy, Abe Chait, whose photo you had seen earlier, who was the dominant Jewish organized crime figure. And that union accommodation involves these mob connected or mob owned garment shops in Northeast Pennsylvania. And essentially what Min Matheson does working with Abe Chait and other garment worker union leaders is they, they form an arrangement by which the mob will take its non-union shops and bring them into the union, but the union will grant these mob connected shops more lenient contract terms, more flexibility in wages, more flexibilities in making benefit payments, advantages, in return for them coming in. Uh, Min Matheson plays a key role in this. It's one of the things that we talk about, which is that, that like other garment worker union officials, she finds herself having to work with people like Abe Chait or even uh, with, the, with, the, with Russell Buffalino, but also trying to maintain a strong, vibrant union. And so we look at personal correspondence she has with these mobsters in which she says, you know the arrangement we made, and I'm going to hold you to that arrangement. So you said you would pay these wages, I expect you to pay these wages. So she would go toe to toe with them, even as she had to find it a way to make a working arrangement. The culmination of this history comes in 1958, which the dress strike. So over the course of the 1950s, after this arrangement had been made, there was growing and growing slippage where more and more mobsters were operating shops, more and more were asking for more lenient terms. And the lenient terms that the ones already had we're uh, establishing a drain on the strength of the totally unionized sector in Manhattan. So in 1958, the union decided to stage a strike throughout the dress industry, but in particular targeting Northeast Pennsylvania to make a demand that those mob connected shops would now have to make full union conditions. They would have to pay the same wages as other union firms. They would have to meet the same conditions. Essentially, they were saying that former deal is off. And the result was, was a, a, oftentimes at times a quite violent strike, a very militant strike. The photo in the background is from uh, garment worker union pickets active in Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, and, uh, and Pittston. And so our book describes describes that strike in some detail. Now, Mith Matheson's main antagonist throughout this, the person for whom she has the the, the most antagonistic relationship, was Russell Buffalino, and. Uh, Russell Buffalino is the dominant organized crime figure in this area. Before we began our session, one of the gentlemen who was here was, uh, was referencing this event. One of the things Buffalino comes known for in 1957 is he's one of the people that's arrested at the Appalachian Mafia Conference in New York. So he's one of those 62 mafia chieftains. And this is a photo on the right of him at, uh, at his lawyer's office after that arrest. New York State Police, FBI records indicate not only was he one of the people that attended Appalachian, but he was at the time thought to be one of the key organizers. And FBI speculation at the time about why this meeting was held also related to the fact, right, this meeting is in November 1957. What the FBI thought is one of the things they were talking about was the upcoming looming garment district strike, which they knew would impinge on these mafia connected garment shops. So our book has some information on Russell Buffalino and the Pittston mob, and, uh, and we draw both on the state police records uh, from Appalachian, but also from uh, Pennsylvania state police records and FBI records, but also in terms of the early history, and I, I heard people mentioning this, uh, Robert Walensky and William Hastie's book is very good about the earliest origins of the Pittston mob here in Northeast Pennsylvania, right? Which is this notion that its history goes back to those mine wars in the late 1890s, early 1900s. Essentially, what you had were efforts by, uh, by coal mine operations to find a way to get around the union restrictions, United Mine Workers, 
And so they began to subcontract or lease mines to mob connected firms. And those mob connected firms would then use their muscle and corruption as a way to evade the union controls in terms of not just wages, but in terms of how much coal could be dug and where that coal could be dug as well. And that becomes one of the early power and profit centers for, uh, for, for organized crime. Buffalina, who is the dominant figure in the piston mob by the 1940s, has strong roles in that coal mining industry, but he also has strong connections to garment industry, garment truckers, and the garment shops. If you look at the state police records, he's also a key figure in terms of organized gambling. So uh, like an organized floating crap game that's quite big, but also big stakes poker games. He plays a pivotal role in bankrolling them and providing security. And then we can't say he's necessarily loan sharking, but like other dominant organized crime figures, he tends to provide the capital to other mobsters who then loan that capital out and loan shark loans. Uh, Historically speaking, from what we could see in the FBI records and in the state police records, this Pittston mob was affiliated with the Genovese crime family in New York City, one of the five families, if you know the La Cosa Nostra history. And FBI records sometimes depict the Buffalino wing and the Pittston mob as one of the crews within the Genovese crime family. And then we saw FBI records that seem to indicate sometime in the 1950s, it goes from being a crew affiliated with the Genovese crime family to being its own family. But if it's its own family, it maintains that strong affiliation with the Genovese crime family, such that according to some reports, Buffalino in the 1970s gets appointed essentially as a stand-in or substitute boss for the Genovese crime family in New York City, which is how he comes to be connected to the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa in 1975. So the FBI's main suspects in terms of who was behind Hoffa's disappearance in this period really was this smiling guy on the right, Anthony Provenzano, who was the head of a Genovese crew in New Jersey. And so the best assumption the FBI has is that it was members of Provenzano's crew who, uh, who killed Hoffa in July, 1975. But the suspicion is, or the FBI's suspicion was Provenzano only acted after he got Buffalino's okay, essentially with Buffalino as being the acting head of the Genovese crime family at that time. Now, the new account of the Piston Mafia that came out is uh, Willem Delia's book, uh, uh, written really with and by Matt Birkbeck. And at that note, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Catherine Rios, who will tell me when to click. Yes, I'm going to tell you when to click. Um, we thought that'd be less clunky than shifting screens. So click. Um, we're going to pivot a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, David has the historical story and all of the really rich details of the what happened part of things. But I kind of get oriented towards how the stories get told. So you can see here, you know, uh, just a small slice of the array of stories that kind of cover these, the characters that we're talking about and the, the situations that we're talking about. Um, and um, they're all covering different genres. So Dave, go ahead and click and we'll click through these bullet points. Um, so one of the things that we can look at, we have nonfiction here, we have cinema, we have memoir, and we have kind of journalistic um, memoir. And each one of these stories has is kind of somewhere on the spectrum of fiction and nonfiction. I will even say that's true for our book, which is historical, but um, of what, you know, I can say how we are also concerned with framing the story. So each one of these books up here in the film too, is situated somewhere in the degree of fiction and nonfiction, even, you know, um, the Buffalino book that, um, the Life We Chose, referenced the writing of Fred Sheeran's book, I Heard You Paint Houses um, with George with uh, Brandt as kind of like a perpetual effort to get the story right so that it would be compelling and sellable as a book so that he could get something out of it for his legacy. So you have this personal account that um, is cast and recast and cast and recast until 
it becomes publishable that or attractive to an audience that you you know that the publisher is going to see we can sell this story. So that's a way of shaping a story that has an objective that maybe doesn't have a direct relationship with what what we can think of as true events, um, but it's based on true events. It's just true events told through a certain frame and for a certain objective. Even our book, which is historical and based on historical research, we have to find um, framing devices and characters and understand the characters' motives to tell a story that puts all of these events in a larger context, but makes it identifiable and interesting for the reader. You have to utilize um, you know, write creative writing techniques like um, launching with an inciting incident, such as a murder. When we do that, you know, there may be a suggestion that all of these events are the the that are caused by this particular murder, but the murder is just the inciting incident for the storytelling. Um, it's also needs to be placed within a larger historical context, uh, and that can be a challenge with with historical writing. Uh, then you have uh, we I heard you paint houses cast as a film, the film is uh, you know definitely following different genre can conventions. Dave, can you go ahead and toggle through some of these, go ahead and put these, these points up. The film is, um, is going to have to cast the story with really broad thematic strokes that are going to be attractive to a massive mainstream audience. And I would say the Irishman's central themes are themes of masculinity and codes of masculinity and power. Um, and those are deep themes that are going to run through the whole storytelling and really determine how these uh, events get depicted and how the relationship between the events are characterized, which is all being designed to evoke an emotional reaction because it's a movie. Um, and then we have The Life We Chose, which is a journalistic memoir. Um, and it's going to also be looking for a, a relationship with the audience. And it's going to have a methodology that is pretty straightforward with kind of oral history of a single person verified by, you know, basic journalistic research to you know, make sure the fact checking is right and that there's enough context to thread all of these events together. Uh, these are all different ways of addressing audience expectations and fulfilling audience needs for the stories because, you know, these events happened long ago when we hear about them, we want to be drawn into a story and, and understand you know, the history, but we also want to be entertained. That's one of the themes that runs through all of these books. And we have to find the right genre for it. And then they each are going to adopt different methodologies. And those different methodologies may affect the level of credibility that you might have for these books. Um, Dave, go ahead and click. Um, and and pop on the first the first bullet point. So some of the elements of the story, we're familiar with the basic elements like setting, character, um, that sort of thing. But if you really want to dig down and kind of interpret the elements of a story and how a story is told, you can think about the point of view. What is the point of view of the story? So in uh, the life we chose, we have the point of view we have the point of view of uh, these characters, Russell Buffalino and this story told by, oh gosh, now I'm completely blanking on his brain. Or what's uh, what's the guy's name, Dave? Delia? Yeah, no, the the subject, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, B Billy, Billy Delia. Sorry, I was mixing him up with the author. Um, we have, this is all a story told from his point of view and it's going to be centered around the things that are important within his uh, his circuit, like the 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 mobster's point of view, what is important to them, and how they tell this story is um, you know centered on these personal relationships that they have and the connections that evolve through a lifetime of working together and the you know betrayals and um, and tests of 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 loyalty that happen over the course of a life. Um, that's when you look at Fred Sheeran's book, the point of view is coming from, from his point of view, but he's placing himself at the center of a bunch of historical events, um, trying to tell the story 
in a way that is centered on what motivates him and his decisions going through these events. Go ahead and click, Dave. So we can look at who is the protagonist and who is the antagonist. And in the life we chose, we have the protagonist as being Russell Buff Buffalino and Billy Delia, and the ant antagonist is, is law enforcement. So they're kind of operating on a code where they are just going about their business, living their lives, doing things that gangsters do. And if only they couldn't, weren't being thwarted by, you know, law enforcement. Um, and you can see a lot of that in the way they frame the events of the story, which I'll talk about in just a second. And go ahead and click again, Dave. Um, some of the little secrets of the books can come from like just asking the question of what is driving the action and what is the nature of the conflict. So the life we chose the nature of the conflict is anything that gets in the way of the gangsters being able to achieve their objective of making money. Like it's pretty simple objectives. They've got to fulfill loyalty. They're pursuing the making of money. That's what they're, that's what they're actually learning how to do. He learned how to make money. Um, and the, um, they're trying to evade, you know, accountability within law enforcement. And when I think about Russell Buffalino pitted against somebody like Min Matheson, I think, you know, she was introducing some parameters and boundaries to their activity that came from a different code of activity, the code of organized labor, where rules and regulations and, you know, um, honoring contracts is a thing, but you can't function as a gangster in that, in that um, system. And you can't function as a labor organizer, organizer in the system of a gangster. They are just two colliding codes of conduct. And Dave, go ahead and do the last one there. Um, the other thing is looking at the nature of the resolution of the story. Um, the life we chose is a very chronological sequence of events, and, and it really concludes with Everybody has died off or has gone to prison. Russell Buffalino has died. Billy Delia is uh, reflecting upon whether or not he has any regrets in pursuing this life that, that you know, as uh, Russell B Buffalino said, this is the life we chose. And that's a moment of personal reflection because this is a book that centers around his personal experience. Um, and in the end, you know, the, the reflection is he doesn't have any regrets um, to the life that they chose. And the, the telling of that story doesn't have to go into the impacts of the people that their crime affected. So it's a very closed story about the nature of their relationship and whether, you know, the encounters they have with um, police enforcement and with each other, but not ever really about the impacts on, on anybody else who might be impacted by their crime. Um, and Dave, the last, the last slide. I think a lot about the way in which a story is told and the language that's used. And, um, you know, I was really struck by the life we chose. It opens with the quote from Russell Buffalino, the impossible we could fix right away. Miracles take a day or two. And that's a statement that to me, that statement is, um, a statement that suggests like that ethos of the gangster where anything is possible. They can do anything they want, any idea they have, they can do as long as they, um, you know, don't get caught. Like there's no pushback. There's no barriers to them just, you know, taking what they want. And if you look at the language of this story, their crimes are very passive. Like they, and they're not passive, they're very violent, but the way it's talked about is like, they come across some jewelry that then subsequently must be fenced or, you know, they're learning how to make money or things were illegally removed. It's, it's, it's spoken about in the passive voice. They're not necessarily the actors on those actions. They are kind of um, recipients of the action. So, um, they have brushes with the law instead of committing crimes. And this book is really kind of, I felt like it was like really uniquely framed in that passive voice way. Um, and I was struck by that because this is a, a story of like some of the most violent people in the country at the time. 
Um, and But yet their self-perception was that they were engaging in a code of conduct, engaging in activities that are just, you know, the things that you do to make money within the system of, of organized crime. And you only really have problems if you have to go up against uh, law enforcement. Um, so these stories are all different ways of looking at um, you know, they, they, all these stories kind of have overlapping events and characters, but the stories themselves are told in very different ways. And I, th I think when you can, when you actually look at and consume all the various, the various stories, you have a fuller picture, but, uh, like the Irishman was a movie made from a singular point of view, which didn't really get into like the richer historical context and look at the impact of these events. It really kind of focused in on a narrow aspect of the story. Um, I guess after being a collaborator with Dave on a historical piece, I feel like the importance is to have like the multiple perspectives that you can place stories within a larger context. Then on the other hand, these books like The Life We Chose and even I Paint Houses, they give us insights into you know, the really internal motivations of the culture of the mobster, which can be hard to identify with if you're not a mobster, I feel. Um, anyway, that's my perspective. And, you know, thinking about how these stories are told is kind of my angle on this project. And I think that's it. We can unshare. Um, yeah, I don't know if, you know, I think we can open up for question Q&A and probably, you know, the historical details are what people will be interested in. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you both for, for joining us. Um, David, Min Matheson is one of my absolute favorites. Um, she's she's on, she's included in, uh, there's a mural in Pittston of um, famous people from Pittston and from the area. Min Matheson is is one of them. Um, and Catherine, I'm glad you were talking about it as as storytelling, as the way they, they tell a story, because they're all characters with a with a capital C, I think. Um but you're you're right. When they do tell their own stories, they never mention what they did. They talk about everybody else, but they, they never never quite get into their their own their own details. Um it's always something that happened around them by accident somehow. Um so I, I know I'm sure everybody has everybody has a story about Rosa Buffalino in this area. Um but does anybody have any any questions or anything anything to, to share? No. George? The only thing I can say is I really enjoyed it, and I like the bridge between uh, the Garmin district and um, the racketeering, uh, um, dealing with Buffalino and all the mob. I thought that was interesting and a concept. Tell you the truth, I never did hear or read about. And yet, as you mentioned with the various books, each one of you something differently. But together, collectively, it comes up with a true story, a combination of what actually did take place. So I thought it was very interesting, extremely interesting. And thank you. Well, thank thank you for that. Yeah, it was really good. I think good. that's exactly my point is, um, you know, individually, each of the books tells a single aspect of the story, but collectively, they they tell a really rich, complex story. Yeah. Gives you the full picture of it. You know. I I have a question. Um earlier on it was mentioned that the corruption in the police and the corruption in the courts in New York and New York City uh made um sort of provided a, a good environment for the mafia to um to infiltrate the union um, and force the union to sort of um, get in bed together with the mafia. So in Northeastern Pennsylvania, what were the factors that kind of supported the um, the joining of the union and the mafia? Were there similar issues? Yeah. So my perspective is, uh, my perspective is, that there was less of a joining in Northeast Pennsylvania. And so if you think of like uh, Min Matheson's relationship with uh, with Russell Buffalino, it, 
it was, at least from her internal correspondence, really quite antagonistic. And so there was a way in which she she could she could deal with them and she could meet with them. But you didn't get that sense of like uh, of a of a of a co-opted union or a co-opted union official. Whereas if you think about New York City, you know, there were there were locals within the garment industry in New York City, garment workers union locals, that the heads of those unions were essentially co-opted by by organized crime. So the the main local that organized the people that drove garment trucks was a was local 102, and its head was a guy named Sam Berger. And Sam Berger is to use the word of organized crime. He was an associate of Abe Chait, and then an associate of this guy uh, uh, Johnny Dioguardi. And so and so he really was, you know, to use I think to use your term, he was in bed with the mob. But you don't I don't see that in terms of the garment workers union leadership in Northeast Pennsylvania. Clearly, there's a level of, of, of official corruption in the sense that uh, the organized people, organized crime figures like Buffalino would have had to have had some connections with corrupt police in order to run uh, organized gambling operations, for instance. Like, you know, the, the secret of a mob connected uh, a gambling operation is it, it, it should be somewhat hidden, but it can't be so hidden that if I, David Whitworth, want to go spend my money gambling at your operation, I can't find it. And if I can find your gambling operation, then it means the local police should be able to find your gambling operation too. And then the only reason why the local police wouldn't find that gambling operation is essentially if they're choosing not to. And that's the heart of the way police corruption tends to work with organized crime, at least in that period. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I have a question. Was there a lot of violence dealing with the garment industry and, and the mob being involved in it? Or was that maybe a front or something else they're doing like gambling? Yeah, so, you know, the way it works for the for New York City, uh, and, and there was some of that here as well, but but in New York City, the way it would work would be like, uh, like the murder of Lurie, you know, that happened in 1949, it, it would be the case that the mob would resort to violence. Mm -hmm. So that murder of Lurie is, that's not a usual thing, a more typical thing that we were finding in the strikes that happened around 1948 and 1949. And even earlier, as the mob like established relationships with particular uh, union leaders, is, is they might not kill you. But for instance, there was a, a number of people who were brought in as like, um, I don't know, the union brought in as picket line specialists from the Seafarers Union who had uh, a better reputation for violence. And mm -hmm. they were being ambushed on their way home from picket line duty or on their way leaving, and they would be attacked uh, and knifed. And the mm -hmm. notion of the knifing wasn't that they would be killed, but that they would be so brutally scarred that, uh, that it would send a message. So mm -hmm. that that particular picket would really seriously think twice about continuing to participate, but anybody who saw his face afterwards, you know, with say 20 or 30 stitches across the cheek, they too would think about it. And so it's an element of terror that would be there. Mm -hmm. Let's see, thank you. I think also it's it's interesting just to, to point out that, you know, when when the garment industry and the, the IGLW were active in the Wyoming Valley and the Lackawanna Valley, mining was declining. This was mm -hmm. the garment industry was was the story at the time. They were the only they were the ones that were that were working. Um, that was the, the primary industry in in the region. Then it was still just the garment industry. Um, mining mining was declining. Mining had its own you know union issues and, and labor issues. Um, dealt with often in the same way um, with brick bats and knives. Um, but it's a, the the women were were kind of were taking over um, as as union as union activists. It's it's a nice it's a nice idea. Yeah, my husband did this. Now I'm going to. I kind of like that idea. <laughs> and then Kat referred to it as well. Catherine uh, Rios referred to this as well. Like by the time Billy Delia is coming up, right? So he's, you know, he's he's essentially a baby boomer. Like so, by the time he's he's moving into the Pittston mob, the garment industry in Northeast Pennsylvania is fading. So when you read his account, it, it's not really a thing for him. You know, to the extent that there's still a Pittston mob that he's involved in, it's you know he. He has recollections of uh, a Buffalino being involved, but his personal involvement doesn't involve the, the garment industry at all because it's 
it's largely gone away by by the point by the time he becomes a prominent mobster. And as Catherine suggested, and I, I I thought she made a really nice reference to that. You know, it's unclear from Delia's book exactly how he does make money since he never engages in actual violent crime of any kind. You know, it's. It's somehow he manages to be a very powerful, frightening mobster with strong ties to Johnny Gotti or Stanfi in uh, Philadelphia, but he himself never seems to have done anything that was particularly nefarious or violent. It's it's a question of credibility from my point of view uh, on that. Or brilliance on his part. Yeah, sure. That could be, that could be the case. I, I say brilliance. He wasn't caught. Yeah, I think um, I think to me that it says a lot about how how uh, the, these characters can engage in this lifelong, you know, lifelong crime. They know they're criminals, but whenever they're faced with accountability, it's an affront to them. It's like somehow this violation of 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 their, you know, their lifestyle. Um but they they know they're criminals, and it's just that the criminal lifestyle is 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 has legitimacy. So you know they they come upon you know piles of jewels that have to be fenced. If they're the ones who have to fence them, mm -hmm. it's just the way it has to be. Um, and I think that that's I don't know. I, I as a as a writer, I feel like you know if I need a character, um, I need to understand their motivation. I need to understand how they square their activities with their with with their principles. So, you know, at this time, you know, and in our book, we profile some other really high, high level gangsters. It seemed to me that there was a real effort. I think Russell Buffalino had a little twinge of this himself to try to aspire to legitimacy to or to at least have a facade of legitimacy that they could so they could pass in a legitimate business world and interact with people as legitimate businessmen. Um, and that they, there seemed to be this desire to have that, to be able to do that. And maybe if you tell yourself that, um, you know, the, you're just, you're, this is just the way you make money. It's just the game that you play. Um, it just happens to be illegal on every front. Then that's how you can reconcile those actions. Maybe they sell, um, make them feel them, themselves feel better with the idea of one. A lot of them are so religious as family. They contribute a lot to the community. So with that, they alleviate any guilt feelings that they do behind the screen. So maybe that's the way they look at it. I, I think so you're heard. Right. <laughs> There's something to that, you know, especially the philanthropy angle, because they are all very heavily philanthropists, you know, making, giving back to the community. And um, they never talk about all their crimes are victimless crimes. Like they're only hurting and the violence only is bestowed on other, you know, criminals, but their, their money making is all victimless crimes from their perspective. Well, and also they're hard on their own family. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they go against their code of law in the family, they're the most to be killed, you know, to be violated. So um, though they extend it beyond the family, they're really hard on their own family. You know? But I found this very interesting, this topic, an interesting topic. Okay, David and Catherine, again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and everyone else, thank you for, for tuning in today. As I said, this is our last episode for 2023. Um, we will be returning again in January. Uh, January always marks Anthracite Heritage Month. Um, and in starting in January, uh, we will be commemorate our program will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the John Mitchell Memorial statue in Scranton. Uh, the statue was dedicated by the United Mine Workers um, in May of 2024. So our program, our Lackawanna Pastimes program in January um, will begin our year-long commemoration of that of that statue. So again, thank you everyone for joining us and have a happy Thanksgiving. Lamur, Lamur, ta -ta 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 -